Good morning, First Parish. Good morning. This is the fifth Sunday of the month. It happens to be Trinity Sunday, which is why we're starting with Holy, Holy, Holy. But we always have a hymn sing on the fifth Sunday of the month. And the first request is this magnificent piece, Abide With Me, page 487, first and last verse, Abide With Me. have a request. Next hymn. Yes, Jamie. Hymn number 515, but please verse 1 and verse 2. 515. Next hymn request, someone's making tea. Robert, 488, nearer my God to thee, verse one or five.
request, next hymn request. Favorite hymn, yes, madam. 403, verse one and first and last on hymn 403, Lord, I want to be a Christian. Yes. Eternal Father, strong to say. What page is that, Mr. Johnson? Yes. <laughs> we would like to sing Eternal Father, strong to save. Thank you, Reverend. 535. First and last. And it's perfect because it's Trinity Sunday, and the last verse is about the Trinity. I see you. Page 400. Thank you. <clears throat> there is a bomb in Gilead.
Parish. Thank you so much, Purse Parish. And now we'll go. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Welcome, welcome. If you're a visitor to First Parish, a special welcome and a special hi. Hopefully, I'm seeing our streamers. I'm not sure where we are with the technology. Darn, not yet. I'm Robert Guptill, and uh, I wonder how many can guess what I'm holding in my hands. Tickets. tickets, that's right. I have, I think I have 10 of the last 40 tickets remaining for sale. Do you remember what I'm talking about? June 17th, uh, Noel Paul Stuckey and his wife, Reverend Betty Stuckey, will be here with their One Light Many Candles. It's a great program, and if you don't have a ticket, you can't get in. So if you're like some members of my family and you kind of wait till the last minute, the last minute's almost here. Thanks. Ah, good morning, First Parish. And you are the body of Christ. You could have chosen to be anywhere. You chose to be here. And I give God thanks for that. I have two announcements as we move deeper into our worship time. One, I want you to note, be alert to a change in our bulletin. We have a change of order. We will be doing the offering um, after we hear the scripture. It is a different way of doing it, and I try to give you some warning so that you don't experience spiritual whiplash. The second thing is my bad, my oops, and I stand before you uh, asking your forgiveness. In our bulletin, in our closing time, there is something that is listed there that actually comes from three years ago, the joy of computers, but the downside is I didn't pay attention. We will not be singing what's there. We will be singing Go in Peace, as we usually do, number 349. So now, if I've thoroughly confused you, I've done my job, and I invite you to listen, to listen carefully, to allow the voices of our choir to bring us even more deeply into worship. On this Trinity Sunday, come Holy Spirit. I invite all who are able and for whom it's comfortable to please stand with me that we might share our voices in the call to worship found in our bulletin. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. Let us sing to the glory of God. For the Lord has comforted the people and has compassion for all. Let us sing to the one who ordered creation and guides us even still.
continue our shared voices in the unison invocation found in our bulletin. Let us say with one heart, soul, and voice, Most holy God, we once again await the touch of your spirit with eagerness. We humbly ask that we discern your spirit in the lives of each one of us today, refreshing and renewing and healing us with the power of your loving spirit, that we may live with purpose and enthusiasm and courage after the manner of Jesus. On this day of remembrance, may we renew our commitment to co-create with you a realm wherein your justice and peace may prevail. In the name of your Son, our Lord, we pray. Amen. My friends, please be seated, and I invite the church school to please come and be with me up front. All right, John, this is good. <laughs> Okay, good. Yes. All right, Jojo. And some balcony dwellers. This is good. All right. <laughs> okay, I have, I have um, a story to tell and some questions to ask. I am a brother, and sometimes I wear my brother hat. My sister Doris comes up and she tries to beat me at golf. And she's a really good player, but she always ends up not quite beating me. But I think it's because of my brother hat. I wear a hat as her brother. But there are some times when my children come and visit when I wear a daddy hat. And this daddy hat is one that is a wonderful one, and, and I enjoy it, and I enjoy my kids. I've got a daddy hat. But then, three years ago, I was able to wear a grandpops hat. Grandpops, a grandfather hat. So now my, that's my story. I have a brother hat, and I have a daddy hat, and I have a grandpops hat. My question. Which one of these hats is me? When I wear, which one of these hats is the real me? Which one of the hats is Doug Nielsen? I saw a hand go. Did you have a response to that? Oh, thank you. You can come back next week, too. Every single one of these is me, right? Because sometimes I am a brother. No, actually, all the time, I'm a brother. And then at the same time, I am a daddy. And at the same time, I am a granddaddy, a grandpops. All three of those at one time. Today is Trinity Sunday. It's when we take one of the great mysteries of God. How can God be creator or father and Son, as in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. How can three be one? Well, I don't know, but I think it has something like wearing all those hats. All three, all three of those hats are me. All three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, all three are God, are one. Three in one. Now, if anybody ever says, can you explain the mystery of the Trinity? You can say, yep, it's like wearing three hats. <laughs> All right? Down to your class at this time. Nice hat. Let's turn us on. Here we go. Bye, kids. Have learned something for us, OK? This morning's anthem is based on one of the three readings of the lectionary. It's from Isaiah chapter 6. It's Isaiah's call. And I chose it about a year ago as I planned the music a year ahead of time. 
And in it, it talks about the cherubim or the seraphim, mystical creatures of God, some people would say, or dragons, they have six, six arms, legs, wings, or they've been described as angels of power and warrior and an angel of knowledge and messenger, just like we sang in the opening hymn. And it talks about Isaiah's mouth being seared with a hot coal. It's been purified. And he's terrified. And yet, what does he say? I hope he says what all of you will say. I hope you say what he says. Here I am. Send me.
Good morning. Uh, the reading that's listed in the bulletin is not what I'm doing today. I'm going to be reading to you from Isaiah chapter 6. You may find it in your Pew Bible on page 595 in the Old Testament, and I will be reading verses 1 through 8. The vision of the Lord enthroned in glory stamps an indelible character on Isaiah's ministry and provides a key to understanding his message. The majesty, holiness, and glory of the Lord took possession of his spirit, and at the same time, he had gained an awareness of human pettiness and sinfulness. The enormous abyss between God's sovereign holiness and human sinfulness overwhelmed the prophet. The Vision of God in the Temple. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, high and lofty, and his hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance with him, and each had six wings. With two they covered their eyes, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. One called to another and said, Holy, 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 Lord of hosts, the whole world is filled with your glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man with unclean lips, and I live among people with unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one seraph flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the fire with a pair of tongs. He, that seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Amen. a response to that scripture and that anthem, I invite us to into the offering, understanding that which we bring are symbols, signs, and tokens of our very lives, a way, a way that we can say, here am I.
gracious God, for these people and these plates, for this place, and the way that your spirit infuses it all and brings it all together in your loving embrace. We give you thanks. In the name of your Son, Jesus, and to the glory of you, Creator God. Amen. My friends, please be seated. How many of you are wondering, like I am, gee, did I close the windows at my house? <laughs> uh, well, you know what? There's nothing we can do about it right now. But there is something that we can do about what we've just heard. From Isaiah, the image is a powerful one. The call of Isaiah to be a prophet. And it is really tempting, I think, to understand God's call as something that exists especially for and maybe only for prophets, them, out there. Or maybe for preachers, them, out there. But here's a dirty little secret that we celebrate every time we do a baptism. The secret is that we are all called by God. Not just the Sunday school teachers who stand in our midst and be commissioned, oh no. And not just a commissioned minister of music, no, no, no. And not even just the Stephen ministers amongst us commissioned in our midst, no, 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 no. All of us are called by God. The beauty of the lectionary that we work with is that there are at least four scriptures that are chosen. And Isaiah was one of them. And a curious piece was also, as is in your bulletin, from the Gospel of John. And in that piece we have Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus was the one who, who snuck quietly to talk with Jesus. He was a Pharisee. He was part of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the day. He had a certain regal bearing about him and a social responsibility as a leader in the community. He upheld the tradition of the Hebrews. But there was something about Jesus. There was something about him that compelled him just to check this guy out. But he couldn't do it publicly. Couldn't just come out and say it and do it. No, no, no. He snuck over at night and said, talk to me. And Jesus did. And what he said to Nicodemus was, in effect, good to see you, but anyone that wants to follow me has to be born from above, has to be born anew. And poor Nicodemus, you remember the story. Nicodemus goes, huh? What, what? Wait, I'm already born. How can I go back and be born? Like, you know what? And Jesus is, I think, doing a play on the word. And John uses the word anathan, anathan. It means three things. It means born up from above, again or anew. In effect saying to Nicodemus, you gotta get a new life. You see, Nicodemus was a little schizophrenic. He was the Sanhedrin representative, the Supreme Court of the day, and he was a seeker, a curious one about Jesus. He was of two minds. And Jesus said, you may be of two minds, but you need one new life. Nicodemus may be like some of us. Unlike Isaiah, Nicodemus said, impossible. Can't be done. How can you be born again? And Jesus 
reiterates it. And as searingly as the ember of the fire from Isaiah, crystallizing and compelling Nicodemus, who has this incredible journey. He comes at night initially. He stands up for Jesus in the Sanhedrin saying, this man deserves a fair trial. And then he's the one that ends up giving a, a burial place to Jesus. What an incredible transformation. He was called out by God to follow Jesus. What kind of impossible transformation is that? Isaiah transformed by the burning ember. Nicodemus transformed by the very word of being born anew above again. And we dare say that being called is not us. Not, we're not being called. It's, it's those prophets over there and it's those preachers over there and it's those teachers over there and it's those Stephen ministers over there. No. You see, that kind of thinking is impossibility thinking. Not possibility thinking. And we live and love and are in the presence of and are called by an impossible God. A God that so loved the world. That makes all things possible. God can use even Phil, even Ed. God can use every one of us, and all that's required, we don't have to go burning our lips, all that's required is to end up where Isaiah and end up where Nicodemus ended up. Here I am. Use me. Impossible, people say. Because you know, you, you've got, we've got, I've got impossible things to deal with. You've got, I've got, we've got things that seem absolutely impossible to us. Oh, Doug, I could never do that. I'm not, I'm not trained to do that. You see, God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. But first, I've got to square away my finances. I've got impossible bills coming in. My income does not meet my outgo. It's impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. So every time that you hear someone like me saying, you are called by God, remember your baptism, remember your vows that you take every time we bring somebody to that baptismal font. We are each all uniquely and wonderfully called by God. Impossible, you say? We live in the very love of a God who makes all things possible. God so loved the world that now everything is possible. I'm going to invite you to affirm that. I'm going to invite you to absolutely say that a number of times. I'm going to give you some sense of what's impossible. And I want you to respond. I want you to respond. God so loved the world. I don't think I can face another day of this terrible job. It's impossible to do it right. God so loved the world. It's impossible for me to manage staying in my house by myself any longer. God so loved the world. I can't seem to get control of my impossible drinking, drugging, gambling. God so loved the world. I have 
an impossible situation with my kids. It breaks my heart. It's impossible. God so loved the world. Is there a problem in your life that you are facing, that you know is impossible to deal with? God so loved the world. There is nothing that is impossible. Isaiah found it. Nicodemus found it. I suspect if you give it one iota of chance to sit in your soul and in your mind, you will come to understand it as well. Anothen. Anothen. Born again. Born from above. Born anew. For God so loved the world. For God so loves you. Nothing is impossible. Let the people say amen. amen. Let the people say amen as if they really believed it. Amen. And let the people shout it so that the people on the street could hear you. Amen. Blessings. Friends, please be seated. Those with challenges of health, many of them with the challenges of cancer, have been part of my prayer life this past week, as they have for weeks and weeks. Gary Dixon continues his up and down, sojourn, home, and then back in the hospital. For Gary Dixon, I hold in prayer. For my neighbor, Mark Murray. For Jill and Kristen. For Nancy Marston and Eric. For Patty Plummer and Bob Hickey. For Patty Sprague and Jim Blood. For Paula and Tom. All of these people journeying for physical well-being. We hold in our prayers, I hold in my prayers, for the divine intent of healing and wholeness. For the grieving amongst us, for Matt's loss. For Headley, a dapper and wonderful man, typically sitting right down there by uh, Rosemary, who has died and whose family now is grieving. For Tyrone, not many of you know Tyrone. Tyrone is the very, very closest friend of Meg, who is Glenn and, uh oh, um, <laughs> yeah, Scylla's daughter. Tyrone ran in, or was run into by a car which in itself is a bad thing. He was on a bike. But I, he's all right, right? Bruised. Road, road rash. But wow, could have been 
So prayers for recovery. Not only the physical recovery, right? But the kind of game that plays when you're in the city and riding a bike. And a joy. Remember, we're, we're, we're praying for a small baby that needed a heart. Huh? Guess what? Baby got a heart. And is out of the hospital, staying close, probably coming back in June. New heart. Parents are greatly relieved, still a little cautious. So for Wesley, we hold in our hearts the strong new life of this young heart. So those are the prayers that I offer. I ask the deacons to come down a little bit uh, so that we can hold your prayers out loud. And Jane, would you come down here with Linda, please? Start us off, Linda. A prayer for my niece who has spent years struggling with depression and mental illness and has managed to climb up high enough that she started a job this past week. Um, the prayer is for success and wholeness in her journey to keep moving forward. Thank you, and thank you for lifting that up. Mental struggles, mental health, some say mental illness, is frequently a secret, a dirty little secret that is kept, not unlike addiction struggle. Kind of keep it to ourselves. In the light of God's love, we bring these prayers to God for these people. Um, there's two up there, yes? Um, is there a microphone? Oh, you have the microphone, good, okay. Lisa? I just wanted to um, say some joy and thankfulness. First of all, my twin sister is doing so well with her new kidney, I'm just thrilled. She will be back to work in about a month. And I'm feeling much better, and I'm gonna start work at the end of this coming week. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for all your prayers and concerns and meals and cards. It's, I felt the love. I really felt the love going into surgery and beyond. So thank you so much. So her new kidney is your former kidney. Correct. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Lou? I want to thank all the people that are making it possible for me to go to the Pilgrim Lodge next weekend for a woman at the well. For the way that God's spirits work in generosity. Thanks be to God. Pam over there. I'd like everyone to pray for me and Tim who are struggling with mental illness, addiction, and homelessness. Yes. Yes. I'm Tim, and I was about ready to ask for the same thing. I, mean, I beat prostate cancer twice, and after that, started this battle with mental illness again and addiction again and I just pray you know after I beat prostate I said there's nothing that's going to hold me down after beating prostate cancer twice so I figured I'd give this mental health and addiction shot one more try thank you you keep trying Tim absolutely thank you both for your witness of the struggle and the hope and the promise of God's healing touch in your lives. Thanks be to God. Jack? Uh, this is a, asking for a prayer of celebration. Tomorrow is the anniversary of my wife's 39th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say how many. <laughs> and, what, a, and, what a smart man you are. <laughs> I learned it from my mother and my mother-in-law, yes. <laughs> and uh, it's a busy two-week period. Our son has a birthday coming up on the 15th, and our anniversary comes up on the 14th. So this is a two-week period of great celebration within the family. Thanks be to God for those celebrations, and I'll add to that Lynn and Jamie Beals celebration of an anniversary as well. Thanks be to God for those times of marking Dennis? Uh, prayers for the four million people in Houston 
which include my cousins um, and also cousins in uh, Austin. For the people in Texas and in Houston, etc., that are experiencing something that I'm not sure I can even begin to imagine. I mean, I was teasing about wondering if I left my windows open. I get weirded out when there's a little bit of water in my basement, right? So for that experience, for those people whose lives are changed profoundly, we offer our prayers of support and, and thanksgiving for all of those attempting to make it better. John? Uh, some might remember that uh, my mother passed away of cancer in February. Uh, well, we buried her yesterday. And, uh, I thought it was going to be okay. Um, just pray for us as a family that moving forward um, in a world without her. And, uh, the funniest part of the story was um, we were waiting at the graveside and there was no priest. And 45 minutes goes by, we're all standing around in the hot sun. Where's the priest? Everybody's scrambling, trying to figure out what to do. And he shows up and he had no explanation. He said he sent, something was holding back. And we all agreed that it was my mom, <laughs> um, if you knew her. I feel like it was my mom's last practical joke. <laughs> it was totally something she would do. So it was kind of a fun story to go with it. For the grieving that happens, for the humor that can be present, and for the way healing will be yours, we offer our prayers. Me? All right. Um, a, a prayer of celebration and support for um, yesterday, the main conference elected, selected, and installed a new conference minister, Reverend Deb Blood, and that's a celebration. And as you say, someone must be certifiable to take on that job, and we all really need to pray for her and for the success of the conference. Yeah, she said yes, like Isaiah. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind gets involved in this. Thanks be to God. Patrice? I think we want to add a prayer on for the baby who got the new heart, and that is for the family who is grieving for the child who gave the heart. Thank you. Thank you. That is a very helpful corrective. We, we pray for those struggling with health and sometimes forget those that are struggling with them. We take joy in a organ donated, sometimes forgetting the tragedy that made it possible. Thank you for that prayer. Jane down here with Judy, celebrating her 39th anniversary. I'd like prayers to go out for all of our graduates that they move along the footsteps that they desire to have. It is that, that season, is it not? For the graduates, for those that are commencing, for those that are on their way to the next adventure. We offer our prayers. And my friends, in a way that makes sense to you, in a way that is right for you, I invite you to move to a place and space of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, Creator, O oh, gracious God, Redeemer, 
O gracious God, spirit sustainer, hear the prayers of your people, those that we've spoken out, those that we've kept silent, those that vaguely move through our hearts and souls. O gracious God, creator God, redeemer and sustainer God, the prayers that we bring can be our offering, yet again, offering ourselves, our compassion, our celebration, our caring, our concern, our connectedness. God, hear our prayers. Use us. Use our willingness. Call us in ways that we can discern that we might be instruments of your peace, that we might tell the good news to your world, that we might beckon others to come close and be embraced by you. And hear us, O oh God, as we share the prayer of your Son by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. invite our voices to be shared yet once again in our closing hymn, Blessed Are They.
books away, those of you who might need them. We're closing not with what's in the bulletin, but in the hymn 349, in case you need to have those words. But if you don't, that's good too. Because you're going from this place with the power of God present in your life. You're going from this place with the inclusion and the invitation and the excitement of sharing the good news. You're going forth as people who are loved beyond your imagining and beyond your shortcomings. Go forth with the power of God in your life. Go forth in peace. Thank you.